Okay, so the, the format of the workshop um, we have two papers in the afternoon and then a, a round table in the evening that allows us to take up um, some of the issues that emerged uh, between the two papers and in each of the, the papers in their own right and possibly some more fundamental issues about their consequences for materialism, I suppose. Um, since it seems like most of the people here are the same people who are here this afternoon, uh, there's probably not much point in offering too thorough uh, um, recapitulation of the, of the content of the papers. But um, Miran Bojevic, uh, just very briefly, um, gave us a reading of a canonical materialist text uh, from the 18th century, uh, Diderot's uh, D'Alembert's Dream, um, and reflections on uh, sort of logical problems of thinking of material God, um, problem of sort of uh, composing a materialist text, I suppose, uh, the possibility of philosophy sort of speaking matter directly or matter speaking through philosophy. Um, and Graham gave us a, an anti-materialist uh, lecture um, from the position of uh, contemporary realism, trying to think uh, the constitutive conditions for a, an adequate um, contemporary realism um, and pointing out the problem that he sees with materialism. We can't really think the integral constitution of individual objects um, as substances. Um, so, I mean, I can think myself of uh, a number of connections between uh, the two papers, some of them having to do with epistemology. You know, how is it possible to speak about the real, for example? I mean, in Miran's paper, uh, for Diderot, um, maybe it's not so much a problem because the real speaks directly through us, speaks directly through philosophy. Materialist philosophy is materiality articulating itself, I suppose. Um, and so the, some of the epistemological problems um, that were the focus of the Q&A um, after Graham's talk uh, might have some relation to those, to those issues and yours. I thought the other really interesting um, connection possibly between the two papers has to do with uh, sort of literary form of philosophical discourse. Um, uh, Miran, on your paper took up uh, the question of the dream in D'Alembert. Uh, what are the consequences of the fact that uh, the speaker in the second half of the text is in fact dreaming? Um, what does that have to do with uh, the fact that we're dealing with you know, matter articulating itself through this speaker and not really conscious um, subject making arguments? And Graham, you closed your paper with a sort of reflection upon you know, the necessity of style, I suppose, uh, as opposed to just purely logical argumentation of philosophy. So, I mean, those are some of the issues that I'm interested in between the two papers, and maybe we can return to them. But I thought uh, maybe a good way to, to just get us uh, started is um, if either of you uh, have questions for each other or questions that emerged um, that you had in mind in between uh, the two papers, or if either of you want to respond to any of the issues I just, just raised. And well, then hopefully that will just sort of snowball out into a discussion between the four of you and hopefully to, to everybody here as well. One question I have about Miran's paper is to what extent is it necessary to have the idea of a whole? Whether it's a whole that pre-exists and from which everything emerges or whether it's something that is produced. Why does there have to be a whole at all? And actually I'll have this question for Peter tomorrow too when he talks about the will of all the human race as a whole. Do we really need a whole <laughs> in philosophy? Why not just have disconnected parts that are linked, like a, a series of rail networks? Why is it always that uh, there has to be a one involved when we talk about materialism too far? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question, but I'm only, how does it the whole, the totality, le tout, could somehow you know, be a substantial uh, uh, base for material gods to emerge? Mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't, don't you have the same question, Brian? No, you said you gave the example of an army, for example. Mm -hmm. Is an army, as an object, as you understand it, is it just one plus one plus one plus one soldiers, or is it something different? It has to be more than that, because otherwise it's just the unity from the outside, if somebody was counting. And this is a problem I sometimes have about you. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any, any internal feature that makes something what it is, a, a unity. It's, it's accounting that does it. And I think, no, I think that it, it's, the, the things have to come together in a certain way, so that they do exceed their parts, so that there are qualities in the thing that do not, that are not contained in the parts. Uh, 
And so there's a certain, you didn't like the word, well, something you didn't like, and it's that I saw the etymological problem with it, that autonomy makes it sound like you're legislating to yourself, and I just mean that it exists by itself, not that it's legislating. Right. Yes, but what I don't have is I don't have any category of the world as a whole. In fact, I don't think there is such a thing as the well, world Why as a whole. not? Why wouldn't that qualify as an object? It could, but, but it has to be produced. It's not necessary. It's not that there's a one and things, individual parts break off of. It's that you could start assembling things more and more to the point where there was a world as a whole as an object, but it, do, it isn't necessarily the case that there is one. Yeah. Parenthetically, there's not a, a, a total will of, of the whole human race. Is that The question is, is it possible for the whole human race to become self-legislating or autonomous? So it has to be produced. Then this, Absolutely, yeah. but will is a, is a theory of process and production. Yeah. Very much. And then the same would hold true for smaller communities for you. Does Absolutely. it have to be produced also? Yeah, including the people in this room or the four people okay. here or, the, or any, any group. It's precisely that. Okay. I'll save my other questions for tomorrow. I have more. I'm sure. I mean, I mean about the whole in Diderot's philosophy, I mean, it seems to me that um, it's a whole in a process of development and in a process of change. So, for example, the very idea that um, you have the organization of matter at different levels of complexity, let's say, is a continuing process. And the prospect that Diderot raises in the text that um, that process of organization might lead to uh, the emergence of something like a material god that would not precede the universe, um, where the universe would be an extension of that material god, but on the contrary, that material god would be an extension of um, the material whole of the universe. So the constitution of that whole uh, then would be a whole which is in the process of change and development. I mean, it, it makes me think of Whitehead, actually, who says at one point, I think, uh, the totality of all that is is a process, um, uh, is a totality in process of incompletion. Um, so the... A sort of, I mean, it has to do with your question about time. If we have a whole which is in the process of sort of decompleting itself or incompleting itself perpetually, I mean, one question would be, is that really then a whole that we're dealing with, since it's constantly in a process of change? Can it ever be sort of collected or contained as a whole? And then secondly, what, what sort of god, um, what would distinguish the god that would emerge in that situation as a god? Like, what sort of criteria... Um, could we use to distinguish an entity like a god from any other material entity um, if that god is still subject to a process of decomposition and a process of alteration, etc.? I mean, Martin, this ties into some issues that you deal with with uh, theology as well. Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, like, what I wanted to say and what I thought was an instructive starting point in, in Milan's paper um, is... I mean, this idea, if, if, if we talk about change in that way, that is to say, and this is how Bergson talks about it as well, it's an open hole because it's constantly in transformation, so there's no completion, there's no totality in a static sense. But nevertheless, the reason why it's a hole, and I think it's the same in Whitehead, at least in the base of what you were saying, is the fact that you have change, but you don't have time because nothing is actually lost. Of course, there always comes more things, things are in transformation and so on, but it's only conceivable, even theoretically, that it would amount to a whole in process if nothing of what is past is lost. That is to say, in Bergson, this is the pure past, the ontological past that retains everything that has happened. So ontologically, nothing is lost. You have change. You even have irreversibility. It's not like you can go back in time in Bergson, but it's one continuous movement of creation and change. But on my account, that's not a thinking of time because it's not a thinking of negativity. Nothing is negated, so things are changed and transformed. And these are all completely spatially conceived because in spatial movement you move from one point to another the point is not negated but when you move in a temporal movement from one now to another the now is negated so and that's why I was saying in relation to me on that um, I think that a lot of uh, both in classical philosophy and in contemporary philosophy when one tries to be a materialist um, one very easily slips into this type of imminence. I mean, and this would be, for me, the Bergsonian the Delosian model as well, where, like, well, nothing is static, so there are no essences, and nothing is transcendent because there's nothing outside the movement, but you nevertheless retain, uh, you nevertheless don't think negativity as secondary and as not um, pertaining to the real or the material. 
And uh, I mean, some of the shortcomings of that type of model that I'm trying to elucidate and that I will also address tomorrow. So for me, that was an interesting entry point into the wider debate. You know, one interesting point about that particular text, about the notion of this material God, is that um, mostly, for the most part, all these writings, including the clandestine materialist philosophical writings, they were pretty open atheistic. And this is I'm the only treatise I know that's been written you know, within the field of materialist philosophy that's not exactly openly advocating for God, but you know, toying with the idea of a God-like, I don't know, creature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what makes it unique, no? Yeah. yeah. I still find something a bit oppressive about Whitehead's God, uh, in the sense that uh, God is the mediator for all relations. All apprehensions go through God because the eternal objects are all there. And so even if God is in process like everything else, there's still a special status for God. God is, God is what comes between any two things. And if Whitehead had simply removed the eternal objects from his system, you wouldn't need that God. And this is what I would recommend. You just dump the eternal objects. You have no platonic forms that are recurring many times in many different things. Then you can just get rid of God from his philosophy. That way, uh, Latour does this. Latour, of course, is a very religious man in his private life, but there's no God in his philosophy. Really, not very essentially. He's got that one bull Jew today, but he, it's not. God is not a major part of Latour's philosophy. But he has, he has similar ideas without that, without a privileged entity that does all the relating. That's why I prefer Latour to Whitehead. So, how do we account for um, something like a geometrical? Entity, let's say, like the idea of a triangle. Without, I mean, how would that work in your system without without something like the eternal objects in Whitehead? Sort of rational yeah, coherence yeah. of the composition of a, that's right an ideal form like that. I want to get back to you on that one. <laughs> I've not thought much about the philosophy of mathematics in my system. Yeah. But I suspect, I suspect it would have to be a, a right triangle would have to be an object. Well, no, I don't want to go there. I'm not sure how I do this. There's a problem. How, how do you see around the relation between the material and the rational in Diderot? I mean, the material and the rational, like the idea of the whole, as Hegel, for example, will later develop it, is, a, is a, to the real as the whole, but the real is rational. And it's essentially grounded on the holism, or at least internal cons consistency of reason which is obviously, I, I think, a crucial idea for the Enlightenment in general and for the Encyclopedia project, mm -hmm. that there's, the parts of the Encyclopedia are not going to contradict each other and therefore you can rearrange them alphabetically. And mm -hmm. In other words, they're self-ordering or, self, or they're ordered at a fundamental level. Mm -hmm. But they're ordered be, and so they can integrate into a whole, mm -hmm. um, but because they are fundamentally reasonable. Rather, is, is it that that's fundamental or is it their materiality that's fundamental? Yeah. Um, one problem is um, in the group that, um, um, how to say, this order is changing constantly. Everything is, a everything is in a perpetual flux. That's one point of the dilemma. And the other point is that the group says if the phenomena are not tied down, if they are not, I don't know, constant for some time, we can have no philosophy. So there you go. No, you how to say that the, uh, the whole is not rational, it's irrational, you know, you can't mm -hmm. grasp it, you know, because it's already changed. I mean, the, the moment you, you, know, you try to understand it, you try to uh, explain it, yeah. so it's unintelligible. Mm -hmm. yeah. And <laughs> associate freely, <laughs> a little bit more, yeah. You know, one, uh, one, one point that attracted me to, to this particular concept of this material God was that, you know, uh, years before that, I... Uh, when I came across in Hume, you know, this, um, <laughs> the concepts that I couldn't help liking at the time, you know, the, the infant date, the superannuated date, the senile date, and so on, you know, the date is, you know, being changed through time, you know, so this is, I guess, the only one, uh, the only instantiation of that kind of graph that I know of, yeah, so that's why I was immediately attracted to it, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I just thought maybe Hume was joking, you know, or, or not being serious, but uh, here's the one, no? And um, the, how to say, the, um, the maybe, like maybe that's just an empirical contingency, but they did meet, you know, in those years. Regularly for two years in, the, in that atheistic materialist circle uh, gathering around Holbach and mm -hmm. exchanging all these uh, crazy ideas, uh, unorthodox ideas. <laughs>
but this god will still have some limitations because of sure. his material being? Oh, sure, sure, sure. There are, there are severe limitations to this god. I mean, up to the point that I don't want it needs to ask what kind of a god actually a material god is. Yeah. And that's what Nathan was asking, that what is it that distinguishes them, this material entity? Yeah, and no, what yeah simply, being, you know, simply being a whole, being conscious of itself as a whole, being conscious of itself as a unity. That's the and that itself is encompassing the process of everything that happens? Yes, or? Yeah. That's how I see it. Yeah. What if it would be limited by special relativity? So this God couldn't do anything faster than the speed of light. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> These kinds of material constraints, yeah. Okay. Unlike Deleuze's God, <laughs> who moves at infinite speed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah Pata. Yeah. Maybe just uh, ask Renan, so somehow. Um, I was asking myself so during your talk that you spoke about autonomy. Of the objects, but that somehow I realized that since so you came back to, to Kant, that to one thing would interest me if objects are autonomous, if they relate or not, is then um, the other thing. But what, what this or what ethical relevance would that have? In a sense, and I guess Kant, in some sense, is not just the it's a target of preference in points of uh, Epistemology, but also ethics. So, uh, how this relating of objects or not relating of objects without you know, any, any, any participation on, on human side and on the same thinking, presuming the uh, vehicle footing of, of, of all objects, mm -hmm. what, what actually ethical relevance would it have? In the sense also that materialism was a had been a prominent, actually also throughout the history, prominent uh, use at some point. It, it could be used uh, still maybe as a token for debunking and the other, but it has been a prominent concept in also in ethics in some sense, also as a kind of ethical choice. So, what would actually this autonomy of project uh, mean ethically? A couple of things. Uh, one. One thing is that it would tend to point to human character over human actions as an important thing for ethics. If you're talking about the style of things as being something deeper than any of its specific actions or manifestations, you're already talking about potentially a good person who is good despite doing only evil actions, as far as we know, or vice versa. Uh, and that's been done by some people in ethics. Shaler has done that. Uh, it also potentially pushes ethics beyond the narrowly human realm, and this has been done by Lingus, for example, in the imperative, where he tries to say that there's an ethical imperative not to chug a really expensive wine fast, because then you're not respecting its dignity and autonomy as an expensive wine. I don't know if I'd go that far, but there's the potential there for, for bringing inanimate objects into the ethical sphere. And, I'm, and I, don't know, I don't know how far I'd want to go, but I've always been uncomfortable with this idea that eth ethics ends with the human. And I've been concerned especially about animals, but you, I think you could push it further than that. Is, is there, could there be something ethically wrong about destroying, tarnishing a beautiful landscape by putting a smokestack there or something, perhaps? Uh, so it's le I guess it's less the... Well, no, it is the autonomy of objects. The autonomy of objects from each other and from us uh, requires, I guess, responding ethically to the things as withdrawn unities and not as things that have visible properties. In the case of humans, not as things that have done tangible actions. Um, you see a little bit of this in Heidegger also in Being in Time. The last time I reread it, was, which is when I taught it in Amsterdam, when he talks about how rules are inauthentic. Ethical rules are inauthentic, and you can always violate the rules, because what matters is something deeper than the rules. And you can think of, think of it in terms of actions. What's, what's real in a person is deeper than their actions, perhaps. I don't have a developed ethical code to give you. Although on our blog, we've been getting more into ethics... Uh, I and some of the surrounding bloggers. We, we've been—I don't know how many of you read these blogs—but we've been talking about trolls and what what, what K. Punk calls uh, great vampires. I think these are ethical categories. The troll is someone who merely critiques. We call it the sneer from nowhere. Someone who sneers from nowhere. They're simply coming and undermining whatever you say, but they're never standing anywhere in particular. And, and having a pseudonym helps. It's not necessary, but it helps to have a pseudonym because then no one knows anything that you're committed to at all. 
And there are always certain people who pop up on the blogs negating everything I say from nowhere. And then there's the great vampires who seem positive, and yet what they're doing is they're always asking for clarifications, and they're saying that they're a little bit puzzled about this, but they're also never specifying where they stand. So I guess there's an ethical implication here that you have to, you have to declare where you stand before you critique. You have to be committed to something. There's an ethics of sincerity there, I think. I'm trying to develop this on the fly, just trying to figure out what my own ethical commitments are, and, and in the blogging I can see it in areas like this. And also a support of... Another thing that came out was a support of fans, because there are a lot of people attacking naive fans who are slavishly devoted to their masters in philosophy. And I don't think that's the way it works. I think that if you're the fan of a thinker, you are committed to something deeper than their surface doctrine, right? You're committed to something that's in them more than them. Uh, I, so for, in my own case, for Heidegger or Latour, I mean, I, I'm a fan of Latour. I'm not uncritical of Latour. But what is it that you're a fan? What does it mean when you're a fan of someone? It means that you are you are wishing them well, you're committed to them, succeeding in most cases, and yet at a certain point you're willing to criticize some service manifestation of their doctrine and commit yourself to something deeper in them that is not falsified by the problems with their surface argumentation. So in Latour's case, the fact that he relationizes everything is something that I hate, and yet I still love Latour anyway. Anyway, this might sound a little scattered, but I think the key idea in all these points is that the ethical unit is something deeper than the actions. That follows, that follows from the theory I've given, I think. Which is not true of all philosophies. Existentialism would say the person is nothing more than their actions, right? I mean, just to, to come back, but, so, but then there is a kind of deep ethical confidence in a sense. So that even if things happen, Heideggerian ethics? Heideggerian ethics? I would say the opposite. I would say voluntaristic, at least in the early Heidegger, right? That there's, there's no way to distinguish between one decision and another, or the ethical value of one decision and another. And that's another question I have repeated tomorrow. Um, fatalism? Certainly not at my standpoint. But I, there's, there's a close link between ethics and, and letting something elude any particular characterizations that are given of it. I thought in Heidegger the, the criterion would be to what degree can you own it, right? To what degree is it your own most or Yeah. Which would not at all be my criterion, but <clears throat> but that would distinguish there are degrees of conformism and yep. and, you know. Um, in next sentence more generally though, there is I think in South there's a distinction between actions and a, a deeper intention, as he puts it sometimes, fundamental intention or a project, mm-hmm. which is not reducible to the Although it's certainly bound up in the actions, it's not exhausted in the action. And I think that could be re, 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 rethought or reworked in terms of willing. But I, um, I had a, a, an, another question for you. What, what happens if you think of your objects in terms of uh, as events, let's say, um, which, and I'm thinking here a little bit of Levi, Levi Strauss's. Uh, critique of South, but he says that for, for you to think any event, so uh, any basic, uh, totally banal event, like a football match or something like mm-hmm. that, you can always do the two things that you criticize today that materialism does. You can always undermine it or overmine it. He doesn't use those terms, but you could always break it down in something more elementary so that the, the football match would be the sum of all of these small actions mm-hmm. that each individual component, person, and participant does, which could themselves be broken down to the level of subcellular, you know, mm-hmm. chemical reactions, etc., and that, that would go, presumably, in line with the sort of Kantian idea of the infinite divisibility of particles and so on. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, and on the other hand, you can always integrate it into ever more um, abstract levels of an integration or comprehension. So, a football match means something according to, the, say, the emergence of a culture industry or mass sport or participation, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Yeah. 
Um, and that actually what, you're, what an event does is it, it you know, you can always do those two things to explain it at either level, but that, but that the event is that which holds those two things together at a level of, a certain level of pertinence. Like a football, like you gave the example also of a boxing match, right? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure there if was an object or an event because the title bout, so you have two boxers, a promoter, a ring, equals, I would have thought, event, right? It equals a, a and, and, I, and then reciprocally, you only have a boxer if you have the events or processes that, that include things like fights and everything around that, the promotion, the commercialization, the history of pugilism and so on. Um, so how, I guess, that if you were to think of these objects in terms of events, would you be hostile to materialism in the same way that you uh, outlined this afternoon? Well, they are events. Um, but I remember, I think any real event becomes an object in its own right. And the reason it's an object and not just an event is because an event suggests to me that it's too bound up with the particularities in which it occurs. Whereas I think a, a, uh, something like a football match would have a certain unity regardless of how the effects are varied. And, perhaps, and to some extent, regardless of how the pieces are varied. You can vary the pieces. You can, you, can, you can sack one player from the roster and replace him with another, and it's still the same match, roughly. Um, However, one thing I, I would add to this, though, is that an uh, object might not always have external effects. This is what I call sleeping objects in that, dormant objects in that paper that I had printed in the pamphlet here. Well, this is why I'm not a panpsychist, for example, because even though it looks like, for me, all objects should have perceptions, they can, but they only have perceptions for me, not insofar as they exist, but insofar as they relate. In other words, insofar as they're part of another larger object. But you have this surface of entities in the universe that don't necessarily relate to anything else. And I, I call them sleeping because this is somewhat what we do when we sleep. Right? We're not unreal when we sleep, but we withdraw from relations to a certain extent, refresh ourselves this way. Um, well, consciously, but if someone prods you, you wake up. I mean, you're it's still not completely. You're never completely asleep. Mm -hmm. But in ontological terms, you could be. There could be certain entities that exist right now that are not affecting anything else. But when you say you, you mean your conscious self, because your body is still related to the. To gravity and the but I wouldn't. On. But your body's not you under my model. Your, bo your body, in a certain arrangement. The you, I mean, the self is basically a monad. Is that really what it amounts to? Like a, the soul that animates a thing. It's a monad, but it's not a permanent one, and it's certainly not an eternal one. It can be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So I like everything you say about time. We need mortality. It's all about survival. It's not about mortality. So uh, that. Uh I want to ask you, I thought it was fascinating when you responded to Aaron's question how you understand the ontological difference uh, in Heidegger. And it seems that you understand you would align being with reality and beings with relations. That's right. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and reality here would be the reality of an object. Yes. And beings would be relations. That's right. Okay. So if that is to set up... Uh, doesn't that, that makes being into a being, right? Uh, I, would, I would say the being is always the being of a being. And Heidegger is actually mixed on that. Sometimes he says it's impossible, and sometimes he says that the being is always the being of a being. So the textual evidence is mixed in Heidegger for that. Right. So I don't feel like I'm flouting him too badly by saying so. But right, there's, there's other times when he uses the ontological difference to make it sound like being is one and being, so the plurality of things. I think that's the bad side of Heidegger. But there's also a third option, because... What? And I was struck by that when you talk about withdrawal, you talk about the withdrawal of an object. Okay. That's to say the withdrawal of a being. But Heidegger is not saying that there is a being that withdraws. He's saying that being is withdrawal, which is different. So that's when he's trying to think of the of difference, he doesn't want to make being into a being, whether that's an object or God or something else. Being is time. Being is withdrawal. That doesn't mean that something is withdrawn. It just means that there is a skipped withdrawal. And so... What you're doing, even if you want to twist Heidegger in a different way, like it would seem that Heidegger would tell you that you're making be turning being into a being, and regardless of what status you want to call it being physical or a form or something infinitely withdrawn, it would seem that that's the understanding of the ontological difference that he is trying to get away from. So I would not say I'm turning being into a being. I'm saying that being is always the being of a being. There's okay. a difference. There's a difference. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's true that early on, especially you know, even in the tool analysis, it's not clear that there's an individual withdrawn hammer. It seems more like a system. Uh, but by the time of the thing, it's quite obvious that the individual thing has some status outside of our access to it. Um, because there's not just Earth, which is one. There's also gods, which merely hint. They're plural yeah. in the fourfold. And so there, there is a status of the individual jug. Is, I mean, the withdrawn side of the jug isn't just a shared withdrawnness shared by everything. Yeah. There's something about the jug that's that holds the wine 
that is inaccessible to us. Right, but I would the way I understand those texts though is that like it's true that he describes things in those way, but then like the withdrawal of being is not the same thing as the inaccessibility of the thing. That I say the withdrawal of being is not the withdrawal of a being. It's just that there is withdrawal, there is displacement, there is time, which is not which has a different status for Heidegger than any object would have, regardless of how you want to conceive that object. And uh, that would be the that rather than the what. Kind yeah, of. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it, it would seem that like since you're drawing on these analysis, and even if you want to do something, I understand that you don't want to do something in the name of Heidegger. That's not the authority of your argument. But since in the way he's articulating these things, those are distinct levels. It, like, is there? And and this is related to what I was saying before. When you, if you grant them that this withdrawn object nevertheless can be indirectly affected and destroyed and so on, mm-hmm. Heidegger would say that's precisely because being is withdrawal, being is time, being is destructibility, and that has to be ontologically conceived as having a different status than the object. And it seems like you don't thematize that dimension that allows, you grant that the object is destructible, but like, wouldn't you need an account of what ontologically makes it destructible? Since it can't be something internal to it, because it doesn't have any internal relations, but something subjected to it, and, and uh, this in, in Heidegger's state terminology, this would be the withdrawal of being. For me, it's the arrangement of the pieces that gets disrupted. This is why the thing is destroyed. It gets, it gets undercut from below. This is why it's destroyed. It itself can't be touched to be destroyed. You're right. But, uh, but that's just another object that causes that. I think though, there is nothing but objects. I don't accept any unified sense of being. I know Heidegger often does. I don't think he always does. And I think you can see this in Levinas, the early Levinas, mm-hmm. where you have this unified being that has to be broken up by human consciousness. I think that's the bad Heidegger, and it's in there, but it's, I don't think it's all but, but, I, but, yeah. but that's why I said the third option. I don't think this is a unified notion of being, because that's, again, if you think it's unified, you're thinking about it in terms of a being. Like, that's, Heidegger's trying to rethink the sense of being as temporality. But as a verb, right? Yeah, as a verb. So that, that's why there is withdrawal, but there's not something that is withdrawn. It's, so, it's not, uh, so as soon as you think of it as unified, as opposed to being divided, you're not thinking what he's getting at. But this move is often made. This move is often made by people who say there's this withdrawn, kind of monolithically vague thing, and then they say, but it's not one, because one is an effect of human counting. But I don't accept that. If, if, if it's not specifically broken up into individual entities, then you're saying it's one. And there are problems that result from that. Wouldn't it be like the coming, like Nazi puts it, the coming into presence of the comings into presence of all the different things, but that these comings are not themselves present or, or presentable, or they are pure verbs. They are the giving, the dunia, you know, the... Coming into being precisely. I don't, I don't accept the pure verbalization of it. I think you have to have, there's going to be, if you, once you've got one, it's, then it's a thing. It's not going to be a thing in the same way as a visible thing. But it's, it's going to be it does get to the, the question, the status of change in your work. So you'll often say that um, object is what is primary, uh, or substances are what is primary, and change is then what has to be thought on that basis. Mm-hmm. Um, if one turns it around and says that, you know, temporality, or change is what is sort of ontologically primary and linked to you know, an inherent destructibility in the way that Martin tends to argue, uh, then you don't run into the problem of having then to think change um, through uh, relations between individually constituted objects and the whole problem of how is it then possible to think change. So for example, you argue that um, one reason we can't reduce an object to the totality of its relations is because then it would be impossible to think any change. Mm -hmm. Why would there be change when relations are all sort of infinitely networked already? Mm -hmm. But if we think the constitution of objects as a process of constitution that emerges in time and through relationality, then you don't really have that problem. So why the insistence? It's still possible, in my opinion, to think the coherence of an object, even though it changes through a temporal process, why the insistence that we have to think of it as an integral substance sort of outside of change or process and then you know, be able to produce an account of how something like change or process is I think if, possible. You, if you start that way, you just have different problems. Right? You have the problem of why the no world doubt. is articulated into pieces in the first place. Because as soon as you define things in terms of the relation of change, things start to bleed together and it's hard to see why it stops. It's hard to see why things aren't completely holistic and completely co-determined and then why are there individual regions of this holistic cosmos. That's one problem. Another problem is... Uh, if you have different relations to the same un- underlying entity, how are you going to explain why it seems to be the same underlying entity? You're going to say there's just family resemblance between my perception of this and his and yours and the tables. 
why would you privilege the family resemblance of, of all the distinct qualities that each of us sees over the fact that there's some underlying thing that each of us encounter differently? So in a way, it, I mean, I would argue that, that my starting point is better, but I think you have problems whichever way you, whichever way you start. That's always going to be the case in philosophy. Um, you said something else that maybe... Oh, anyway, go, go ahead, because it'll come to me in a minute. Can I, can I follow on that? What, yeah. But why, why does the relation collapse? Say, say you have a relation, say, of exploitation or domination, which differentiates then, or, or differentiation, it's another okay. relation, which differentiates then an exploited from an exploited. And you, if you have an account, as Marx does, of how these two terms will, will ch- change and clarify each other over the course of the struggle, that defines them, and defines them not... Not by reducing them to the relation, but by saying that they are what they are through the relation. So you tend to say that a relational account, like a Marxist account of class struggle, mm-hmm. which, which certainly refuses the idea that there's a working class in itself that's vacuum sealed and that has some kind of natural essence. And it says what, it is what it is through its exploitation by people who, you know, who have oriented a mode of production around, its, around the extraction of value from their work. But... But, but nevertheless, there is certainly a working class, and, there, there it, and it is what it is in its relation with its class enemies, let's say, or, or with um, the bourgeoisie. And what Marx gives you is an account, as along the lines that Aaron was saying, that allows you to explain that relation, rather than simply accept it as a fact of nature, to explain it and therefore to change it and to engage it, it oriented towards the, the elimination of this, or the, let's say at least the radical transformation of this relation, mm-hmm. Um, so that we could turn relations of exploitation or domination into something else. But, you know, that, that would meet some of your criteria and that we can still talk about objects and things and that have a discrete reality. We can still talk about change. Okay, I would say, first of all, the working class, if it exists, does not have a natural essence. I would say it has an essence. It's not natural. That makes it sound like I'm doing some conservative, risky thing. I'm not. Mm-hmm. But, it, but the working class, in its relation to who oppresses it... Uh, still is what it is, right? It's, there, there is a relation there that creates a new reality, I would say. It's not that the, you can then say the working class only exists through that struggle, because it had to exist in order to enter in this struggle. I per, uh, a different class might have entered differently into that oppressive class than the working class did, right? Or a different sort of working class with a different history might have entered differently into that relation with the oppress, oppressing class. And so there has to be something there before the relation begins. It's a very naive ontological point. And that, what that is is probably not going to be exhausted by this struggle. There are probably going to be features of that working class that are not totally tapped by the specific oppressing class in that situation. I would say that there is a, a new entity that's created by the relation, and maybe that entity has retroactive effects on the parts. That's what I think happens. Right? I think that misunderstands the concept of class. That there, are, that there are elements of work, or working, or labor, yes. Okay. But that the, concept of, the question of a class, at least as Marx understands, is, is only in the relation of class struggle, or... It, it is a dyna- it's a re- purely relational category. It's bound up in that relation and the struggle to change it. And okay. I don't think it exists outside of that. It might not, but something must have. Something like the individuals of the class must have existed before. But this would be making a big mistake, I think. I mean, that right. what's, what's fundamental about Marx is the, is the, the change, to use Mar- Martin Simmons in terms of the judgment, the kind of judgment that's involved in seeing the working class as a class and not as, say, a sociological group. And, okay. and that, that is to, to shift analysis very... Fundamentally, I think, and it's only that the latter that gives you, it's only that seeing the working class as a class in the Marxist sense that gives you a kind of politics. I would, I would agree that new things can be created by relation, but I don't see how it can happen ex nihilo. I don't think that you had just emptiness and then all of a sudden a class struggle begins and suddenly the class and the individuals in the class are constituted. This seems impossible to me. Something was there. This is, I think this is an argument about class consciousness that you know goes back to Marx, but also like via Lukács. It's, it's the idea that. The class, qua class, is constituted in the relation, as Peter is saying. What's pre-existent, sure, it's, you could say it's atomized individuals, or it's a phenomenon of work, or it's all of these things. But to say that what is a coherent object is then constituted in that relation, well, frankly, what was before was not something that was discrete that then acquired the equality of being a class. It was something that was precisely indefined until the historical process of judgment and relation constituted it. So it's not like there is a pre-existent entity that then acquires a new quality. It is precisely a new set of relations that in that process then acquires coherence through its self-reflexivity and its relation to other things. But, but this is built into my ontology from the start, right? Because I'm saying every entity is produced out of component entities right. that come together. 
So this that, this would mean the working class fits my perfect, I think perfectly my definition of an object. I think it does too. Yeah. But I was just saying that that's why I was surprised in this moment that you said, well, there has to be something pre-existing. There is, but it might not be the working class, but it has to be the things of which the class are built. But it's not some thing. It is it is a whole set of relations. It that's it. It's just how are you going to find that thing without the relation of exploitation that defines it as working class for Marx, at least. Or, or in the case of your shoe, of course there are things that pre-exist the shoe, at least the kinds of shoes that we're wearing, the materials and so on, there's a design, etc. there's a history of wearing shoes, but the sh- without the process of, sh- I don't know how you want to call it, the, pre- the, you know, the making shoe, which is a relation to people who use them as shoes, that's the thing I, I will always stumble over, I think, is just how, how that process of making what is a group of working people into something like a working class... But look, if, if all humans on the planet were exterminated, you couldn't have a working class, right? There are individuals there that make up the class. Mm-hmm. But it's the relation so, that makes the class, though. That's the question. It's how you, how you can still think an object like a working class without the relation. You can't, but that, I, I don't think you can make any object without relations, mm-hmm. right? The whole point is an object is formed by the relation between other ex- ob- objects, piece component objects. But it's also and withdrawn from all relations. Yes, but it, they indirectly form a relation that allows a larger object to emerge. There have to be relations, otherwise we would, nothing in the world would make sense. But it's indirect. I mean, that, that indirect um, <coughs> status raises maybe another question from Miran um, that I alluded to at the, at the beginning, a question about uh, the sort of literary form or literary style of D'Alembert's dream. I mean, Graham, you were talking about in your paper how one way to get at inaccessible withdrawn objects is through illusion. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a form of, you know, uh, a literary practice, basically, a specifically <coughs> literary form. Um, and what I thought was interesting in your account of uh, D'Alembert's dream is just that there's something inherently materialist, perhaps, about that uh, sort of imbrication of literary form within philosophical argument. Um, that the, the text has this literary form because that's part of the argument that it's making, right? That the whole is articulating itself through um, sort of thinking or speaking subject almost unconsciously articulating itself uh, through the human, but not sort of as the human, right, but as a material whole. And so I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about um, this question of style or this question of sort of literariness in, in philosophy, because it seems a, like a feature of all of your work to really take that seriously and pay attention to it. And that seems like a real link between uh, your methodology and, and grounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This um, piece uh, that I'm um, it's um, has basically basically that's a theater piece. Uh-huh. You know? It's meant to be played, to be acted out. Right. And it's not only it's a theater piece, but it's a comedy. You know, it's like comedy in three parts. And uh, and uh, um, you know the, this uh, this particular issue. Why this you know this material materialist doctrine is being like presented, you know, through a comedy or, you know, a comedy that's given this particular twist of being, you know, like you have a, you have a dreaming character and um, uh, normally you would find it, I don't know, explained in the sense that, how to say, you know, so the draw in this way, he was, in, you know, he was able to, how to say, he was able to, to risk the hypothesis that how to say, normally um, awaking I don't know. A, a, a waking philosopher would never dare to to um, to formulate. Yeah? But I don't think that's that's a normal interpretation of this uh, how to say, a dreaming subject that you have in the, uh, that you have in this particular piece. But I think it, that that's not the case. Uh, so I would rather argue for for um, you know him being you know like shown on the on the uh, on the stage you know as being how does it taken over by the whole who, who that's increasingly taking over you know who's how does it more and more integrated part he's becoming that's maybe the difference between the I don't know between the the this um, this mo- most common uh, reading of this particular dream sequence and what I was trying to uh, to <laughs> say, to act out uh, here yeah and uh, can I maybe just have a question for my <laughs> for my co-panelists? Yeah, this is uh, how to say, this is coming out of my admiration. It is uh, the, the, um, the the to return to the Iraqi origins of the occasion oh, yes. philosophy. That's uh-huh. not exactly a common knowledge, is it? No, only if you get into the specialists on Islamic philosophy. Yeah. 
then you then you realize about it. You know, so what made, made me wonder uh, is what my branch would say. You know, upon you know learning that his how say, his occasionalism or Gelang's occasionalism is originally coming from Islamic tra- tradition, whereas for him personally it was the way the philosophy started. You know, in, in the Garden of Eden. Yes. That's the philosophy, basically the philosophy of Adam before the fall. Mm-hmm. You know, that Adam, the first man, the first human being, was already an occasionalist philosopher. Mm-hmm. And after his fall, everything is just, I don't know, you know, a, a way to try to, how to say, to recover that lost philosophy, yeah, mm-hmm. which is so basically linked to Christianity, to the Smith. I can tell you what surprised me, which is when I was reading Suarez, and Suarez is about encyclopedic a man as you can get. He should know everything, right? And what he said, he's going through Aquinas' attack on occasionalism, and he says Aquinas attacks this but never gives any particular author with whom it's associated. Well, the reason is there aren't really any Christian occasionalists. Mm-hmm. Aquinas must not have cited any of the Arabs, which is funny because Ghazali was so widely read. But I asked my medievalist friend Katarina in Cairo, and she thinks that was translated at a surprisingly late date into Latin, the incoherence of the philosophers by Ghazali, who mm-hmm. sort of encapsulates many of the earlier discussions mm-hmm. in Islam, which date from around 800 AD. Um, so it is, it is kind of ironic, isn't it? I don't know if Malabranche knew that. He probably didn't. No, no, no. Yeah, he doesn't mention it, huh? No, he doesn't yeah, mention it. Really yeah. yeah. I wonder about Gelang. I, have, I, I, I only have the second-hand knowledge of Gelang. Yeah. Uh, philosophy of occasionalism. Yeah, the, the interesting thing in Islamic philosophy, too, is that uh, occasionalist philosophy is associated with atomism. Because everything is completely discreet, apart from everything else, and uh, it's the metaphysics of atoms and accidents. That God chooses whether or not to give an atom a certain accident at a given time, and duration turns out to be an accident. Mm-hmm. So God can also take away the accident of duration from an atom, and then it disappears. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's quite that, quite that history going on there, which of course was totally uh, opposed by all the, the more famous mm-hmm. Islamic philosophers that we know about, mm-hmm. because they're more rationalists, more from the Greek tradition. Mm-hmm. Avicenna, Arawis, Farabi, earlier Al-Kindi. Uh, but yeah, it's quite a wonderful thing. I, I didn't know about it until I got to Cairo. And I started reading histories of Islamic philosophy, and I saw that, yeah, it, it was there. Occasions was there. It's 800 years later in France. Mm-hmm. Remarkable. Apparently there's also an uh, Indian tradition, too, which I've just learned about even more recently. But okay. A monkey jumps on a branch, and the fruit trembles by, act, by coincidence. Even though the monkey jumped on the branches. I, I've forgotten when, what period that was from, though. I wonder if you could ans- answer your own question a bit. I mean, how do you see this relation between philosophy and literature? And I'm, I'm thinking a little of, Sa- you know, South, who is one of the last, I mean, there have been one or two others since, but the, of the great philosophers who was also a great writer and who insisted on the difference between them and saying that, well, style, yes, very important in, 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 in writing prose and fiction or drama, but not, but in principle, philosophy is indifferent to that. You can write a book that is as badly written as being a nothingness and not feel bad about it because you know, you're just trying to clarify the argument. Right, I mean, so the sort of um, the kind of modest way you can answer the question uh, sort of altercering way, let's say, or Marxist way, where you say that um, materialist philosophy involves a sort of necessary relation to philosophical practice, it takes the practice of philosophy seriously and therefore it engages with its own conditions of articulation, its own forms of articulation, etc. Um, and it's not only the propositional content of the ideas that matters, but also the, the way in which the arguments are made and the sort of conjunctural context in which the arguments are made, but then also perhaps you know, the sort of literary style or the form in which they're made. And so that might be one aspect of materialist philosophy that I think... Um, Again, might appeal to you, Graham. This emphasis on you know on practice in terms of like writing uh, and articulation. The more extreme way uh, would maybe be to argue that materialist philosophy uh, implies the necessity of actually engaging with the material form of the text. And obviously, I mean Derrida uh, takes up this point at some point, right? That the materiality of writing, materiality of inscription, is sort of that one necessarily has to engage with that in order to be a materialist, right? Because the very practice of writing um, and articulating your arguments, that very process of inscription or thinking is itself uh, a material practice, and any materialist philosopher will have to recognize that. I mean, in my own work, I've been interested in these issues in relation to, um, to materialist poetics and, and to you know, forms of concrete poetry. Um, 
what it's not so much an argument at all it's an issue but uh, a materialist practice of inscription which is actually kind of a uh, process of concrete construction on a page um, so thinking about how that can operate then as a form of, of materialism which in some ways is more perhaps more interesting or more materially constructive than, than materialist philosophy or sort of uh, something that materialist philosophy necessarily has to become kind of sutured to or that has to think with. Um. I think personally I don't agree with Sartre. I think a good philosophical text is a well-written philosophical text and Nietzsche says the only way to improve your style is to improve your thoughts. And I'd almost say the reverse too. The way you improve your, I, I do my best thinking when I'm trying to write something well. I found personally, because you have to find just the way right to describe it. And one thing I've always puzzled about is, analytic philosophers are such clear writers, but they're such awful writers in most cases. What is it that makes most analytic philosophy, at least in my opinion, a dreadful bore to read? And I think it's because they think the problem is a lack of clarity. And all you have to do is be clear, and then suddenly you're a good writer. That's not enough. A clear writer is not yet a good writer. And I think it's because a clear writer is simply very clearly listing the attributes that belong to the subject matter in question, and you can't. Do, that's not how you. That's not how you bring a thing to life, just by listing everything that's true about it. There's something deeper than that, and you have to awaken that. Um, Jerry Fodor even went so far as to say in a, in a newspaper article, you know, "Why is the public buying so many continental philosophy books and not our books? Most of us are better writers." And he named names. He said, "Most of us are better writers than Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, and Bergson." I think, what is, what is, he, think what is so. he smoking? Yeah. <laughs> You'd rather read Jerry Fodor yeah. than those guys? I don't think many people would. Um, no, it's the question of dramatization, which South yeah. would agree with you there. I mean, the yeah. moments of genius in his books, philosophy books, are the ones that are most like little plays, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Returning, though, to what, to what Nathan was saying, it's to suture that awareness of philosophy as a practice or even a material practice on that level to like a materialist philosophical commitment seems difficult though because arguably no one did this more than Descartes in the history of philosophy. Like not just like in a way of writing, but even changing language in a certain way. Like I mean, in terms of like and that's it's an acute awareness in Descartes of actually his philosophical revolution being indistinguishable from how he also writes meditations, for example. So uh, I mean, that's not necessarily a point against what you were saying, but it would seem like one... It's a stronger materialist point, actually, that you don't even have to have uh, a materialist philosophical commitment to be acutely aware of the material dimension of philosophy. I mean, it's just, like, intrinsic to to uh, the practice. I mean, Descartes is a, seems like a particularly difficult instance, because, yes. of course, as you read the meditations... Uh, the text itself is supposed to sort of melt away, right? You're supposed to imagine yourself in this room meditating as Descartes is meditating. Yeah. And so the text is kind of a transparent medium there. I mean, if one wanted to make an, uh, an argument for the sort of philosophical idealism behind the dramatic scenario of the meditations, yeah. I mean, that would be it. That it doesn't, it's not so much that it engages with, certainly it engages with the literary form, yeah. but not so much with... Uh, that Uda thinks of as the sort of materiality of writing and the materiality no. of the text. On the contrary, it wants to sort of do away with that for a pure sort of process of ideation, which is accessible through writing, to be sure, but only as a kind of transparent medium. But that exactly gets at what I would want to get at, though, that like you can have, have a, an acute of an awareness of materiality precisely trying to reduce it as much as possible, and that's what the part is doing. In a certain way, there's no key new awareness of the relevance of materiality and then in the attempt to reduce it. I mean, even if the complete reduction is, of course, impossible. But um, because I sometimes have the sense uh, that, uh, and this would certainly be the case in certain texts of Derrida, that like a thematized and explicit awareness of the materiality of the text doesn't necessarily make you engage more in the problem of materiality. Because it also assumes yeah. that there is an intrinsic value value in playing up the materiality rather than playing it down. I mean, if it's irreducible, you can't get rid of it anyways. So you could just as be, well, be aware of the material practice of philosophy by precisely trying to reduce it as much as possible. The card is doing just as much in trying to cultivate it. That's one very profound point. But. I mean, again, I guess what interested me in the relationship between your two talks um, is that that literary form of, of D'Alembert's dream linked to this question of how matter articulates itself through philosophy. I mean, it has a sort of uh, 
it has a certain epistemological value, that way of thinking. Um, so Graham, you were being asked about what's your epistemology? How do you sort of epistemologically ground uh, your account of the synthesis of the constitution of an object? One sort of perhaps extremely dogmatic um, but dogmatically materialist way of answering that question is to say, you know, matter or let's say material objects it's not a question of how I ground my epistemological access to the constitution of an object. It's a question of how materiality itself articulates itself like, through philosophy. I mean, that's a sort of extreme claim that Diderot is making. There you have a situation in which what's being argued basically is that the, you have access to the real precisely because the real speaks itself or articulates itself through you. Um, I mean, I don't know, Graham, if you would find that of any, <laughs> of any value. It maybe doesn't necessarily help with the epistemological concerns that your position runs into. But, but then why privilege matter is the agent in that case, matter is expressing itself? Why not be more specific? Why not say that quarks are expressing themselves or neurons are expressing themselves? Why, why, why this vague, all-encompassing term matter? I don't see the need for it. I mean, isn't matter in that sense, yeah, just an idea, in fact, it's like a limited idea. All we really have are materials or processes or you know, things that are already minimally individuated, at least. Mm -hmm. But what is matter, in fact? if not an abstraction, you know, a useful one, but... I mean, it gets at the distinction between materialism and realism. So it's possible to argue that matter is a sort of generic category or generic concept into which then we can fit or include uh, the, contexts, uh, the concepts or the categories of the development of science and scientific mm -hmm. knowledge. And so the category needs to be generic because science is constantly developing and we don't want to limit our materialism to any particular stage of that development. So we formulate a generic concept like matter, which is then supposed to you know, suture philosophy to science and make sort of uh, philosophy inclusive of the developments of science. But that immediately, I think, I would agree with you, Eric Graham. I mean, How's matter it, more... It, it doesn't really... Insofar as we don't uh, have a specific or particular concept of matter, then basically all that we're saying is there's something out there that we're calling matter. And that, to me, um, makes materialism sort of indistinguishable from what Braver calls, you know, R1 realism. Right. It's just a sort of generic claim. But well, I think that what we seem like one of the real, the most powerful claims or things that Graham showed in his paper was the way that, you know, materialism and realism when confronted one, one another sort of undercut each other. And I thought that was very persuasive. And I'm not sure that that distinction is really particularly helpful, as, as, as you showed, Graham. And it seems like that what needs to be brought in or what has sort of come into these conversations are discussions about ontology understood precisely as a question about existence. And you say, like, what is? You say something out there. And then that, once you start using the language of thing, you get the language talking about concepts of matter, what's real, what's not real. And it seems like the importance of the Heideggerian legacy you're thinking in terms of ontology is you start asking questions about existence. You think about it in terms of process and whatnot. And then the relation becomes one between ontological claims and epistemological claims, which is a different, this is not, does not map on to materialism realism. You can have a formal ontology, which is, I think, something that Martin produces, uh, where there's not really an epistemology. And similarly, Graham's work doesn't, doesn't engage with these epistemological questions so much. It makes these formal claims about existence, not about matter, not about the real, just about existence. And that way you can include Cincinnati, you can include these immaterial instances. So then the question just becomes, what is the relation of the epistemological framework of knowledge to this formal ontology that might wind up in an abstraction, where it just becomes a sort of formal account with no discrete purchase, with no knowledge of particular entities. I mean, you know, Lenin, I think, Lenin's text makes this problem incredibly clear, uh, materialism and imperial criticism, because he's trying to grapple with this problem in a particular scientific context. So Lenin's problem is that at the turn of the 20th century, uh, the results of physics seem to, imply, seem to have implied for many people the disappearance of matter. Right? Matter has disappeared. This is the proposition that he's trying to refute. And so the problem for him is that insofar as we're going to uh, sort of ensure that materialism remains, materialist philosophy remains valid in whatever scientific context one might encounter, then we have to render the categories and the concepts of materialist philosophy sort of absolutely generic. So Lenin says, the only thing which is constitutive of philosophical materialism 
is the reality of matter as such, not any particular trait or character of matter, right? Whatever scientific findings are produced um, about that particularity of matter, you know, materialism can include insofar as it's generic. But then the problem with that, it's a sort of double bind, is that you then render materialist philosophy sort of irrelevant, right? I mean, because basically you're just saying, we open materialist philosophy absolutely to the results of science, and all we have is a generic concept of matter, not in any way a particular concept. And so then the question is, you know, this displacement, basically, of philosophy that you are also dealing with in your text, uh, the displacement of philosophy by something like anatomy, right, or just by empirical science. Why then do we need philosophical materialism? But in order for philosophical materialism to survive its relation to science, it has to render itself irrelevant by operating with generic concepts. So, I mean, that seems to me like a fundamental sort of double bind of philosophical materialism. In, unless its purpose is polemical, right, to argue against idealism, that's right. and that's how Althusser will revive it. Right? That's right. Well, what's the difference between an ontological concept and an epistemological concept in this notion of materialism? Because, you see what I mean? Like, it seems like yeah. that, 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 that's an ontological concept of matter. But it says nothing about epistemological concepts of how we know matter, or how we work, work it, or come to relate to it. It's a propositional assertion right. of the existence of matter beyond the mind. When Althusser reformulates Lenin, is uh, three criteria for materialist philosophy. The first is um, the distinction between uh, matter and mind, or thought and the real. And the second is the adequacy of thought to the real, or some sort of correspondence between thought and the real. And then the, the third um, is the primacy of, of the real over thought. But it's striking he uses the word real. That's exactly how he says it, right? That that is materialism is the idea that the real is intended. It's basically just a, that's right, that's a, a realist schema, yeah. not necessarily in any particular way a materialist schema. And so that's why when you're dealing with materialism, let's say proper, you know, in the sense of like an Epicurean or Lucretian materialism, you have <coughs> the matter, which you which makes it materialism and not just realism. Yeah. And then also all the polemical weight in Althusser goes down to the, the claims around the kind of knowledge of science, the way of knowing the real precisely, that can validate this science of history that he's trying to But then defend. his concept of the way of knowing the real is talking about the distinction between the real object and the object of knowledge. And that's what I think, and you and I have talked about this a little bit, and that's one of the most peculiar things is in reading Capital that Althusser says science operates, science is not ideology precisely because it refuses to collapse the object of knowledge into the real object. Which I've never, and then somehow it's like this recognition of the distinction. He says it's the error of empiricism. And so empiricism thinks it has direct access to the real object. So that's the, dis I mean, the, you know, crux in Althusser is that that's the criterion mm -hmm. of distinction. Mm -hmm. But there's also the criterion of correspondence. Or adequation. Or adequation. Mm -hmm. right? so you have to ask correspondence to what? Adequation to what? Right. Right. And there has to be a distinction in the first place for there to be an adequation. Okay. That's right. Okay. Yeah. But, but there, you can't separate those two problems in Althusser. But just to then make a case for uh, the material rather than the real, I mean, I was very struck uh, about a month ago when I was listening to Robert Bandom at uh, the Collège de France, and he was describing his project of inferential semantics, which was also about material inferences. He was talking about it in relation to science, and he was saying, well, we made progress on all of these fronts, but we are the last frontier. Like, how do, we, how do creatures like us function? Like, how is meaning generated by creatures like us? So he described his project, which is, of course, an epistemological project. In that, I mean, it's not committed to a realism. It, it thinks that the problem of realism is obsolete uh, on the basis of its reading of Hegel. But he's very concerned with linking, making philosophy responsible in relation to science, but not just by conceding everything to science, but saying, like, if we can understand how creatures like us functions, we need a theory of inferential semantics. And that essentially includes material inferences, you know? And then you can argue with all sorts of details about Brown's exposition, but it's still, this would be like a materialist project without realist commitments, because it considers, like, in the wake of Hegel, the question of realism obsolete, but it still is materialist, it's very, very concerned with scientific developments, and um, so I think that would be, in this constellation, that's also a possible route, and in my view, like, 
a really interesting one presented uh, like on the borderline between Kondo and other philosophies. Mm -hmm. um, but I was very struck just by how clearly he was saying like we are the last frontier and here is that's how we saw the task of philosophy. Um, so. Yeah, I mean another way to think about Althusser in relation to these issues is as you said Peter, I mean Althusser, even if uh, materialism becomes irrelevant in thinking that a determinate concept of matter and seeds that ground to science, the task of a materialist philosopher is to ensure that science isn't subjected to idealist philosophical criteria. Mm -hmm. The only task of a materialist philosopher is then to you know, fight idealist philosophy on behalf of materialist science. So there's a dialectical relation between the two. Other questions? I mean, a person I would want also, I don't know, if, um, maybe I'm with Graham here on this, I don't know, but I, I think it's, a, it's dangerous to say that materialism has like an intrinsic superiority over, over um, idealism as a way of understanding a practice. So when you give the practice of speaking or communicating, mm -hmm. or the practice of, say, willing, or the practice of imagining mm -hmm. or thinking, there are, it seems to me that the question is, well, what is the best way to illuminate that such a practice in a particular situation? And there was a moment, I think it's crucial to remember, when an idealist, let's say a German idealist way of thinking about the practice of politics, had much more critical transformative edge than the materialist account because it affirmed autonomy, freedom, the French Revolution, and it did so in circumstances in which that was extremely contested and controversial. And it was that issue you know, that mobilized the enthusiasm around German idealism as a project of thought. Likewise, though, in, around Althusser and 1960s materialism, I think it, it was the opposite. Is that it's, you know, what is it that will allow us to rethink the process of political action, for example, the practice of political action? Um, you know, it ha in a context in which this, you know, the post this kind of falling back on a kind of humanism had cut away the ground of the political edge of a, something like collective, of, of a Marxism, you know, had to be to revive the, the materialist pretensions of a science that could understand class conflict, basically, and that could, that could rationally grasp and understand how capitalism works and so on. But by itself, it, it still seems to me that if, let's say, Althusser had never changed his tack, no matter how perfect your, your scientific reconstruction of how capitalism works, let's say, no matter how adequate that science would be, it would never exhaust the question of politics and the question of practice, which involves also acting on, an, let's say, an ideal or a, on a principle or on a, you know, or pursuing norms of justice and so on, which, which are not easily thought of or reduced to something like a material practice, but also involve a kind of idealist investment in you know, autonomy, freedom, and so on. And that, those, that battle, in other words, is... I mean, Althusser doesn't do no, that. No, Althusser doesn't do that. But, but that, hence, his problem when it comes to the question can't of do anything taking sides, exactly. So, how, you know, if... if but, but that was the point of my uh, reference to Brandon, though, because it seems to me like there is a very strong tradition of philosophical thinking that runs from Hegel and Hegel's absolute idealism, where there is no opposition between idealism and materialism, even philosophically or conceptually. Like there is, there is just, uh, and contemporary versions of this is something like uh, uh, something like Brandon, but also other things that the idea there is nothing in in a certain inheritance of idealism that prevents you from recognizing that we're essentially material creatures and material practices and like that there's a philosophical mission of giving an account of that. So I was like, obviously like classic idealism and classic realism would be opposed, but I think there are many conceptions in which it wouldn't just be the case that like in a certain political situation we should support idealism and not materialism, but there's like a more profound philosophical logic that wouldn't necessarily oppose, at least not absolute idealism in Hegel's version too a materialist understanding of the world. So. And you see this in Johnston's book, but I don't think it's convincing. Right? Where, where Fichte is a materialist and Zizek's a materialist, and I've never understood how that can be so. Yeah, but that's not necessarily... Um, I mean, I, I think it's... The inheritance is... Uh, of Hegel in, uh, in other schools, I think, look, look different. And like, that's not to claim that like, everyone was materialist in German idealism, but that there is... Uh, 
in, 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 in stressing the question of actuality, Hegel actually brings in the irreducible dimension of materiality, but precisely by following the logic of idealism all the way rather than refuting it. And uh, I think that's exactly uh, where a lot of contemporary inheritance of Hegel is located. And that would be at least something to take into account if one is trying to map these alternatives. And I don't think it has to be. But then it's not our one materialism in Braver's sense. It's not mind independent materialism. It's one where you're trying to recuperate the material for the mind by denying that there's any difference. Anyway, I, yeah. I was going to say something else to Peter. That what you said about uh, idealism and materialism being not politically mappable onto liberating or non liberating at all times, I feel the same way about essentialism and constructivism. Because if you go back to the late 18th century, isn't Burke the great social constructionist? And so, and now we've gone through this period where essentialism has been considered a fascist philosophy, and mm-hmm. it's a little frustrating because it's not necessarily a fascist philosophy. But oftentimes, it's deliberating philosophy par excellence. What, what do you mean by essentialism exactly, though? A uh, belief that there is some inherent quality to things that is not simply constructed out of its relations to other things. I think you and I have had this dispute before. I mean, I would agree with your critique of constructivism in that sense, like a, at least a Burkean kind of traditions constructing a certain way of thinking and behaving, which has to be basically, you know, um, protected or guided mm-hmm. or preserved or something. Um, but the alternative doesn't seem to me to would be to say that well, we are we are free to determine those shapes, but not that there's like a. But what there, in other words, what there is underneath that is essentially a freedom of, mm-hmm. or at least the capacity for autonomous self determination. But that, that doesn't require an essence. And well, that itself is an essence. It's an essence in the sense that the person is not totally constituted by their historical constructiveness. Right? That they have an innate human dignity or innate human ability to choose. So dignity is another interesting word. I, I don't mind. I actually quite like it, even though it's sort of, I'm sure some people would hesitate. But I, and, and I think actually it's got a wide resonance in all kinds of situations. But mm-hmm. it's a fundamentally relational notion, I think. Like, it, or esteem, or these kinds of other terms, which have a pretty, which have a heavy, somewhat complicated baggage, but that they're bound up with. Relate, you know. I would find it hard to understand dignity outside of the relation in which, basically, someone honors another person. Again, a complicated word. But I would say they're honoring them because they have to be honored. Would you really want to say that it's, the dignity is constituted by the fact that someone treats you as though you have dignity? But but when the people who argue about respect our dignity make exactly that point, they say we insist that. Um, you who have denied us our dignity, that you accept, that you respect it. That's where the that's where the issue around the dignity becomes acute or problematic or an issue. But you're not saying respect my dignity so that it will exist. You're saying respect it because it it does exist. Right? Mm, I I think it's hard to distinguish actually. Um, we the claim that we have the claim that we're entitled to make the claim that they respect our dignity is something that we have the right to do. Yes, but um, but isn't. Oh. Like an intrin- like in a sort of intrinsic dignifiedness, what would that mean outside of the relations which essentially respect that? Well, because I'm thinking just on a personal level, if you're waiting for someone else to respect you, isn't there something a little pathetic about that? At least it's considered pathetic but by our normal social context. You're saying, don't worry about what the person thinks about you. Have the self-respect. No, it's not waiting precisely. It's a demand. It's a taking of that dignity and asserting of it. But but it's asserting of the. It's not like a, I know I'm. I have an intrinsic self-worth which is utterly indifferent to other people. Is I am I empower myself, or I am empowered, or I claim the power to insist that you respect it. And okay, in doing so, I am dignified. I, I can see that more on the political level, but on the, at least on the personal level, that's usually what you're advised not to do. You're advised not to beg for someone else's recognition, right? That you're supposed mm-hmm. to. Have, it's supposed to be somehow centered on your your own understanding of your worth. And I don't know how, if you want to apply that to politics because it, it wouldn't work there, right? You need you need to be recognized for any progress to be made. So, so uh, but I think even on the personal level, it's that way too. It's, I don't need to go. I don't need to beg you for it. I, but I, um, like you know, I'm talking about an ideal situation. But um, but even in your terms, though, it couldn't be that the dignity was just in the act of demanding dignity, because you you would certainly want to grant dignity to people who are not demanding that, who are incapacitated mm-hmm. to make that demand, for example, you would still want to insist on that dignity. And in many situations, you might even demand that dignity in their name for them. So if you, if you want to make the dignity depend on the act of demanding and insisting on it, what do you do with people who, for one reason or another, 
are in such a situation that they cannot mobilize that demand. Children or the mentally disabled. Oh, but, not, or, yeah. but also many, many yeah. other situations. Where, yeah. I mean, well, maybe we need to distinguish some concepts. Yeah. But dignity in the sense that the people, that in the movements that I'm familiar with in which this is a real demand, like... Um, uh, and I'll talk briefly about one of them tomorrow, Avakleli in South, South Africa, or Lavalas in Haiti, insist on this notion of, hate, uh, of, of dignity, but they insist on it as in the quality of subjects who are able to assert it and ask it and demand it and, and impose it and change the world such that it is respected. And they would resist the idea that, well, we deserve um, your compassion or your pity or your acknowledgement of us as objects in some way. Mm-hmm. And the insistence that you get very powerfully in something like Paolo Freire is that if you, if you start with that assumption that there are people who might, to you, seem incapable of demanding it because they, you're not able or we're not able generally to hear the demand in the way that we recognize, so the mentally disabled children or whatever it is. Uh, but if you think of them as, some, as objects who will then later be ennobled uh, with the dignity of subjects once you are able to recognize them and they're included in the process, you'll never include them. They're already included. You know, it, I would say... Um, Insofar as they are, you know, in whatever way they're they are willing, they're beings capable of making that demand. We just have to, but we certainly need to become more sensitive to it, or, or like those of us who have the privilege of being more easily recognized as, as I suppose, the people who determine anyway the sort of the rules under which under the status quo, some people are quote unquote more dignified than others. Um, you know, I, or the other way to put it would be to say that those people, the people in that position of privilege, are never really capable of yeah. of, um, of of changing the balance of power. It's the people who are who are making the demands, the act of demanding and the changing. In various terms, it's always the oppressed that liberate the oppressor, and never the other way around. So I would say it's not it's not about being more, let's say, more compassionate or more uh, more understanding or more broad-minded in relation to different kinds of victims or excluded people or something, but it's about participating in processes that actively grasp this and change it and impose change. Can can I say here, just the difference between, let's say, the class relationship and the class within the same race, and what you mentioned this on the lecture, I think in the discussion, the slave, and when it's a black slave. Slavery was abolished quite a long time ago, but no matter, even the dignity of matter to the king, whatever, the racism persists, and the slavery, if you wish, the, the distance, persists, uh, perhaps because it's a visible different color, and so on. So no matter what, even the black people, would, the, the, the resistance is much bigger there than just the relation of exploitation. They're not slaves for, they have not been for a relatively a long time, but it's far from over. Well, I agree, and, uh, and the racism is it's certainly something, uh, the question is how do you engage with this, and the, the point that it was, I think, historically controversial was not, at least by the end of the 18th century when this issue becomes politically divisive, at least among progressive uh, you know, people in, say, France, um, where there was increasingly a large body of sort of enlightened opinion that was against slavery in principle, and in, in principle oppo- you know, opposed to slavery, and in principle in favor of the idea of universal equality. But it was, but, so the Girondins, for example, and the people around Brissot and the, the Society for the Friends of the Blacks, where they balked was in the face of slaves who refused it themselves, who actively eliminated, say, the Haitian slave rebellion, which polarized, which basically pushed most progressive white people who would otherwise respect, who might, who might have been inclined to basically acknowledge their dignity from a position of privilege, basically, to say, no, we reject this. And someone like um, Olympe de Gouges, for example, who is a, you know, basically a Girondin, pro, you know, pro-emancipation, anti-slavery writer, said, your, re- your rebellion, which starts two years after the French Revolution, justifies us putting you back in chains because it's so violent, because it's so unacceptable, because it's so disruptive. Uh, in other words, faced with the person who, uh, a, who, a former slave who actively imposes an enter themselves and asserts that you respect their dignity as an equal on their own terms and not on your terms, that is what is, I think, something that was rejected and refused. All I'm saying is that it's in situations like that where people have to... But that's, that's even, you, you, you think of different... But let's say in America, they're Christian, they're not even demanding anything. They're entitled to demand anything. Let's say in America, they're not... 
it's not the same process. All I'm saying is this relational thing that can be reversed by changing the relations is not the same when, they, let's say, when race enters. True. Well, I don't. I, well, all I would say is that the way, only way that'll ever change for good, if you ask me, will be if. If it's um, if it's done subjectively, if you like, rather than objectively, and no amount of enlightened, um, you know, progressive legislation to make people more tolerant, like to to change racist behavior, will ever change it. I think what will change it is, although that might be better than nothing, but what will change it is when subjectively, and this has happened to some degree already, um, people who are the victims of that uh, discrimination actively force change and manage uh, to win over people, uh, you know, who don't have as much of a direct stake in it and, and change it. Like that happened with, say, for example, apartheid, and this happened even to some extent on the issue of slavery, although very incompletely. I totally agree with you there. And that's where the issue of division If I can just in. add one more thing, I remember now Thomas <coughs> Merton who said, we don't... So all I'm saying, it's not that they can do it without us. I think it has to go both ways. Uh, if they demand it, they can demand it forever, and they just don't get it from the whites. But uh, Martin Luther King, uh, Thomas Merton said for Martin Luther King, we don't need the Afro Americans. They don't need us. We need them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say it's all about empowering. To, the dignity, to regain both, both of us dignity. Because it's not just that they don't have dignity. We don't have dignity. No? I mean, we lose our dignity. Yes, that's we true. We think we have. We have power. We Absolutely. Have right. For Peter, good. If I could ask you, though, about what you were saying before about. Um, materialism and idealism like, vis-a-vis you know, processes of political change. I mean, one argument for materialism as you know, essential to like, Marxian thought about mm-hmm. political processes is that you don't need a concept of uh, autonomy or a concept of personal freedom to change a situation. Certainly you need to act in a concrete situation, but what you need is analysis of the material conditions and material constraints of a situation, structural analysis of those conditions and constraints. You don't need a a concept of volition so much as you need an articulation of what is at stake in a political conjuncture, what the structure of it is, what the processes of determination and contradiction, etc. are. And so Althusser is helpful because he gives you a relation between dialectical materialism and historical materialism, political economy, that is to say, which is the means by which you think about and analyze structural contradictions in a situation. And political change doesn't just happen because people will it to. It happens because, um, certainly people do will it to, but it happens because uh, structural contradictions in a situation, you know, accrete in such a way that change, like, makes itself necessary. And it's not entirely clear that it's necessary in some determinate way. There's no determinate action because the situation is overdetermined. It's not underdetermined in such a way that then a voluntarist subject intervenes on the basis of personal autonomy or human freedom. Um, so I just so I wonder about you know the materialist emphasis, um, the materialist orientation of political economy is what most people I think in the Marxist tradition would argue, you know, gives uh, materialism a sort of um, a privilege over idealism. Mm-hmm. That materialism involves, you know, a thinking of structural contradiction and constraint, and that's what political economy does. And that's a very important part of um, understanding a situation in which you find yourself um, capable of exerting a certain degree of self-determination. But, but to say that that and then there is this tension in Marx. I think it varies with his degree of political optimism. So it declines dramatically after, you know, 1850, 1851, and it peaks up again a little bit after the Commune, um, where he's more interested, I think, in what people can, you know, and this, he comes, he gets closer with someone like Blanqui and the Blanquis who were central to the Commune because it was possible in that brief moment to, uh, to deliberately prescribe certain things and to achieve certain things. And I think the capacity of people to, you know, to determine their own course made an impression on him. Um, and I think you, this, the same tension runs through the, the Bolshevik tradition too. I think in Marx, though, whatever, of course, there's an emphasis on, and I, in my opinion, an overemphasis on um, the domain of political economy. Um, but you also, I think, find always 
that what drives under, underneath it is something like a, a valorization of, of um, autonomy and self-determination. And both the idea that people will be at the actors of their own drama, that it's the working class that will work out their own emancipation, that, that communism is a situation in which each individual, as he puts it, will be able to make their own, you know, their own decisions, or that um, you have a world in which, um, in which distribution will be organized in terms of you know, to each according to their needs and so on. Um, but as you yourself have pointed out, there is no working class without Marx's invention of Marx's political economy. I mean, that but, political subject, qua political subject, um, is constituted by, you know... Uh, but in, not just by simple historical uh, factors, but by insofar it's able to conceive of itself as the agent of its own emancipation. That's what's crucial, if you ask me. Of course that happens within... And that's what political economy does. Yeah, but only uh, the danger is that you is that you, as happens often, I think, with certain forms of Marx, contemporary Marxism, and you get bewitched by the this, you know, by the by the forms of capitalism and the way financial capital works, etc., etc., forgetting that it's people that that do that make it work. I mean, it, it, that the point it, would be it's not people though; it's class. I mean, that would be the crucial distinction. It's not people. Uh, one could say it's the masses, and one could say it's class. One could say it's a collective political subject. But it's not, I mean, within mm-hmm. the Marxist tradition, it can't be people okay. or individuals. It has to be... Yeah, no, I mean, right. capital, sense, I, right? I was speaking loose, I can't, capitalists or workers or... Um, but that, that, that there's... Um, I, I think, nevertheless, what's crucial in Marx is the attempt to retrieve a kind of um, a, a domain for self-determination and action in these heavily determined... Um, situations and that, that what he's pro- providing, you know, it's like it's how far does it go? Basically, he says his early work is it's enough really to tear away the illusions. If we could just see tear away these illusions which mask the real conditions of things, we would see what needs to be done and we would do it. So that's still the project. Of the, it's the, I think all through the 1840s, that's the emphasis. It's still the emphasis in Communist Manifesto: tear away the veil, and you're confronted with the real conditions of our existence, and then we will do what needs to be done to destroy this form of exploitation which is killing the world, killing us. And later, I think he realizes that actually, even when you do that, that you realize that re- the reality itself is mystified. Reality mystifies itself, so that we need to carry this work of demystification a further level. And if, we're, if we do that, then we will arrive at a point where we can determine our own course of action, like to some extent the commune did. But, but, and of course, Marx's work in the 60s, you know, 50s and 60s is mainly preoccupied with understanding how it is that reality is mystified. Reality itself, not just the veil. And, and that's his main contribution. Um, so, my, so my question would just be, um, what's valuable in the specifically idealist concept of autonomy or freedom rather than a materialist account of how uh, you know, collective action is not so much necessitated by material conditions, but enabled and propelled and you know, uh, brought to a sort of tipping point by material conditions? I mean... What is it about when one says that there's no necessary privilege of materialism over idealism in these matters? I mean, I really wonder about that. I really wonder if it's actually possible to like properly think the form of action that's involved in uh, political processes as long as one allows oneself an idealist concept of autonomy and freedom as opposed to a specifically materialist one, which is still the concept of autonomy and freedom. I think they're, they're articulated together through the concept of determination, basically, which um, we'll talk about this briefly tomorrow, but um, that has both elements. And in my opinion, if, you, if you're interested in the politics of... I'm interested in politics of self-determination, basically. I see Marxism as a one contribution to such a politics. Um, if it's a politics of basically historical necessity, or if it's a theory which basically val- you know, validates the course of history then I, for one, am not interested in that. Why, why would we want to mortgage our, 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 our freedom, to put it that way, or our capacity to determine our own course to something like a historical logic? They, they, it should be exactly the opposite. If, if Marxism has a value, as South says, it's insofar as it gives us a grip on our own history. I take Marx seriously when he says it's people are the, and that, that's his word, people are the actors of their own drama, that you can, you know, we make our own history. And it's understanding our history such that we can make it that's crucial. But if we were to mortgage or abandon that, the activity of the making and the self-determining, the deciding of our own course, that would be, for me, the exact opposite. I mean, that, that's the mistake that the second internationalist thinkers make. 
and that Lenin himself is ambivalent about, but I think he, he rightly understands, you know, in the moment of crisis in 1917, that, 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 you, that you can't think politics that way. You have to act. You have to decide your own course. You have to, and, and in fact, it's only by doing so that you really understand the situation itself. The further supplement to all of that would be to say that it's actually only the engaging and the, and the determining, and this would be the Sartrean and Baduian emphasis, that allows you to see what, what the historical situation is actually like. That from a distance, more or less scientific perspective, you don't get an actual, an, a, you know, an adequate account of the actual balance of forces. It's only by engaging, it's only by contesting and fighting and struggling with them, and, and that Marx is essentially a, a, a theorist for, for helping to um, explain and intensify the struggle of, of that class, I think, the working class. We should probably wrap up, I think, but just to think of a little bit of a change from the, even though Marxism was kind of international movement, but still it operated sort of within the states now with the global exploitation, even the West already lost, I don't know why they, they dissolved the socialist, uh, the social aspect of the capitalist here, because they couldn't maintain it because they exploit the rest of the world and they cannot grasp who is Actually, you know, they have their governments connected. So the global picture today, I think, is because of our Western technological development is so much more controlling of the helpless that I don't think, uh, well, now a little bit in Latin America, uh, there is some uh, movement that is possible. Positive, but that's Latin America, which has sort of a Western influence there. But when you when you come to the African countries and, and uh, Muslim now, which are obviously uh, not uh, successful at all, uh, <laughs> uh, then uh, I think the, the exploitation has changed. It has become global. That's that's all I meant. Sure, it has become global. I'm not. I don't see why we should be too pessimistic about that. I mean, I think. Um, I would say that, and I hear I'd follow someone like William Robinson, that why, you know, the t- globalization in its corporate form was a response to previous forms of popular and state-based, nation-based resistance that, that limited the capacity of capital to exploit, you know, to generate profit, basically. And that, that, had, had, that had seriously undercut rates of profit by the early 1970s, let's say. And, that, and globalization was a strategy then to destroy those obstacles, to destroy organized labor, destroy the, the sort of post-New Deal nation-state restrictions on capital and explode all of that. And that was very largely successful and it has created a, a new level, a new intensity of exploitation uh, in parts of the world. But to say that that is now a permanent historical condition, that that can't be fought or can't be undone or limited or dramatically or overthrown or replaced, no way. Why, why should we accept that? It just means that we need to develop instruments or forms of action that are adequate to that. And but that's no small trick. Yeah, well, that's what we have to decide. But this, it's no more daunting, I don't think, a task than has been done in other historical situations. We have a lot of the tools we need that have, been for the, that have come along with the same thing that we're trying to fight. Globalization gives us a lot of the tools we need, too. Anyway. Any other questions from anyone who has it? Uh, any chance? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Thanks again, we'll everyone. Leave Global Revolution.